Okay then. Um, we're back on the stage, and uh, we're switching languages for a bit um, for the next next part. Um, I'm joined by Niklas Nylund, who's a researcher at the Finnish Museum of Games at Papriikki in Tampere. Um, he's going to talk about the first Finnish published game, the first game fi published in Finnish, or how how does it work? Well, we'll know in a bit. Yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I'm going to uh, have my talk in English because this, is, this talk is based on research that we've been doing together with, with a Polish colleague, game research, uh, researcher Maria Garda, who is currently working in, in Finland as a part of the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. Uh, Maria wa was supposed to come here, but, but uh, she fell ill and couldn't make it. But still, I, I'm going to hold the, the talk in English. But I'm also open to for questions in, in Finnish and Swedish if you want to do that. But but for technical reasons, we're going to take the questions at the end. So please wait with your questions. Uh, so yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, a Finnish board game, which could be called the first Finnish Finnish board game because it was uh, it, it's the fir first one published in Finland by a fi Finnish publisher, uh, and it was pu published in 1862. It's, it was published in two languages, Swedish and, and Finnish, Lustvati Avasaksa, Huvimatka Avasaksa, and we have a replica over there you can try out. Uh, it's quite a fun game, actually. It's, it's still playable. Uh, but before we go into details about this game, Avasaksa, I think it, it's good to also, also look at the context where this was published. And and sort of the, in, in the historical context, this belongs to, to the category of, of Game of the Goose. Uh, the name comes from one version of this game, which was sent uh, to the king of, of Spain in, in the 1500s. But it's probably it, it's older than that, probably of traditional origin, this type of game, where, where the uh, point is to... to or it, it, it's, the, it's a type of racing game where the point is to, to throw the die and, and move on spaces on the game board. And often there's also uh, sort of a bank of coins that the players, they, they either get p uh, money or, or pay money to, to the bank. So it's a racing game. The first one uh, to reach the finish line wins. And there's, there's many different variants of this, this type of game since the game of Goose, which came out in the 1500s. Uh, many of them deal with geographical issues. In German, there's actually a name for this kind of game, the Reisespiele. So it, it, it's a game where you're traveling on a map or, or looking at pictures of, of different places. Uh, some of these games might, might deal with historical uh, topics or might be sort of whimsical, funny, children's story type of, type of things. And sort of the point here is, according to Bloom, is that Game of Goose is significant in gaming history because it appears to have inaugurated a tra tradition of themed board games, many of which invite players to imagine movement on the board as analogous to, to movement through real-world places. So while players are moving their pieces on the board, they are sort of imagining what, what it's like to actually move about in the world. So, so in a way, this is a new type of game. Uh, here are some ex examples from different Game of the Goose variants around the world. Uh, as you can see here, well, the, the image is not, not, not sort of super clear, but this is a... This is a French version, so it's quite close in aesthetics to, to the original Game of Goose. But here you can see very different versions as well. In the middle, there's a German, German game called Reise um die Erde, which is uh, a humoristic game of looking at different geographical places. And on that side, there's a game from the US where, where players go around in, in, in looking at different places in the United States by train. Uh, so, 
These were published in many different, different places and many different languages. Also, the, we know of some Russian games and, and games from, from Eastern Europe as well as the south of Europe. But looking at, at Board Game Geek, which is a, quite a good source for this, most of the games seem to come from the English-speaking world, but that might only be because most of the active uh, people using Board Game Geek are from that, that cultural background. So there might be much more games that nobody has actually put, put in, into Board Game Geek, and, and many of the Finnish games aren't there. So, so would be nice to, to sort of also work together with Finnish Board Game Geek actives and, and sort of have some kind of project of putting our, our common cultural heritage also for other people to see. Uh, so, as we've seen, these, these are often dealing with, with travel, and many of the games have, have sort of a map metaphor. Others are, are sort of using images of different places, so it depends a bit. Uh, sort of the earliest ones seem to, seem to be in the category of, of using just Im images, while the maps come a bit later, maybe in the late 1800s or mid-1800s. So this could also be sort of one way of, of looking at this, these games. But still, it, it, very clearly, this, most of these are traveling games, sort of being at home and being able to travel to, to distant places uh, in spite of this. This is a Polish, Polish game, and it's one that, that, that Maria has been looking at. It, it, it's called, I'm, I'm, my Polish is not that good, but Grad z Geography Królestwa Polskiego, and it goes on, the title is very long. Um, it's also also a, a geographical game uh, dealing with with Polish history, and it has I think 64 squares depicting different historical places in, in Poland. Uh, it was and this is sort of a game that comes from Maria's uh, research background. She she's from Poland and has been looking into this. It, it's in the National Library of of Poland, and they have also digitized this, so you can look at. Look at it online if you wish. Uh, and this game was at least the rules, or, or, or rather the descriptions of the different places, were, were written by Wojciech Zymanowski, who was a sort of quite central cultural figure, figure otherwise also in, in Poland at the time, a, a romanticist poet and, and playwright who belonged to, to a family of, 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 of people working in theater, etc. And he was also translating from French to Polish, and, and actually made two different games. Uh, so this is a game that we could compare the Finnish game to, and I, I will do some, some comparisons at the end. But it's also something that we want to do more in, in, in the research together with Maria, and, and which we hope to have published uh, at some point. But this is the, here's an image of, of the Finnish game. And the, you can see the rule book, you, you can see the uh, game board. These can also be looked at in, in the Doria.fi uh, National Library Digital uh, Collections, I think it's, it's the official world. So you can go online and, and look at this and, and print out your own copy if you don't have a possibility of playing it, for example, here. So, so it, it, it's a game, game board and, and a rules booklet. And the original game didn't include like dice or playing pieces. It, it was sort of players were supposed to bring their own. And often these were sold in, in, in sort of uh, envelopes in a way. It quite sort of, it, 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 was, a, it, it was not a box, but, but rather a, a sort of thin package. And, and often sold, sold in, in bookstores. The Finnish game is, is made by Hilda Wilson who's a very interesting person from this time. Uh, she was born in, in New Karlebu in, in Ostrobotnia, uh, and she moved to Helsinki to study painting. She was very gifted from a young age. Uh, she was sort of uh, writing poetry, painting from a very young, young age. And another thing she did was design games. Uh, and we know that at least four of these games were published, and the first one of these was, was the Avasaksa game that we're looking at today, but there's also three others. 
uh, Vintern, which was also bilingual, translated to Talvi. There's, there's Helsing Forest Pellet and Riddar Husseti Helsing Forest, which nobody really knows what year it even came out on. So there's not that much details about Hilda's life, but I think it's, it's quite interesting, or she's a very interesting person, and sort of looking at, at the Finnish game industry today, for example, in the digital or video game industry, there's, there's sort of some people are, are, are talking about that there, there's too few women in the industry. I think this is a good example. Actually, the, video, the, the game industry in Finland started by a, women, uh, a woman uh, game designer. Uh, she led, later moved to, uh, to, to London and, and sort of continued her life there. But if we look at these two, two games, the Polish game and, and the Finnish game, it's also good to remember the, the historical context. Both countries, Finland and, and Poland, were actually not independent at, at the time. There was, uh, the Grand Duchy of Finland was an autonomous part of, of Russia, and Congress Bo Poland was also a part of, part of Russia at the time. So it's, it's sort of quite easy to, to connect these games to the, to the nationalistic or the rise of nationalism in, in the mid-19th century, uh, which has been studied a lot in, in different contexts, in, in poetry, in, in, in uh, painting, in music, etc., but not in games. And I think games are a very uh, interesting part of this, this nationalistic history as well. And we're, in the following, I'm sort of thinking of, of looking at some, some of the nationalistic sides, but also some other things uh, related to our Saxa game. So, it, well, some research has been done on, on, on sort of the issue of nationalism and games. There's, there's, for example, a paper by Henna Ulanen that came out in 2017, but that doesn't deal with Avasaksa game, it deals with some other, other games from, the, from a bit later game. But a really interesting read. Uh, and, and a sort of interesting part here, of course, that, that, that nationalism was, was sort of if, if we look at it from a historical context, it, it was sort of produced by different media. It, it, it was produced by images, text. Uh, it, it's, it's very much a historical construct that came, came about for different political and ideological reasons in the, in the mid-1800s. But if we look at, look at Avasaksa, the game, uh, sort of just start, start looking at it. Here, here you can see a map of Finland at the time the autonomous part of Russia. Uh, the actual game, if we place the, the locations of the game on a map, I think it's quite interesting to look at it. It's sort of quite a modern version of what we understand as fin Finland. It's not dealing with, with the uh, western parts, with the uh, Turku region, which earlier accounts, like for example, Topelius' Finland from Stelti Techningar book with, with lots, of, lot, lots of pictures from Finland and, and stories, it was very much concentrating on the sort of that part, which used to be, of course, the, the central region in, in Finland. And it's not dealing with, with these uh, Eastern Karelia regions that were also part of, 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 of Finland at the time. And it's not dealing with, the, with Lapland proper, it's just sort of makes a short, short journey to, to the southernmost parts of Lapland and to, to Avasaksa Fell Mountain, which is, was a, a sort of popular tourist attraction of the time. Uh, we'll come back to that as well. So it's sort of concentrated in, in, in the middle of, middle of Finland. And of course, because the game ca came out uh, in mid-1800s, there weren't that many pictures of Finland. And the game was, was part of, of sort of creating the idea of what is symbolical for ri different places in Finland, different symbolical regions. Uh, it's, to some extent, it's based on, on, on the Finland from Stelti Techningar, which was uh, written by Zacharias Topelius, a romantic poet, but, but illustrated by different Finnish uh, illustrators. So, it, for example, in the middle you can see, see Tampere, the factory city, and it's very clear that this image from the Avasaksa game is, is sort of a copied version of that or, or a sort of variation of the theme. You can see the exact same uh, a view on, on the factories, the, the old Finlayson factories, the first modern factory building in, in Finland with, with 
in the Avasaksa game, it says that it, it has over 1,000 employees working day and night. So the first modern factory building from the same point of view, very clearly related. But it also it, it's dealing with other places, and, and I think it's interesting that, that the Finland Framstedti Tekningar doesn't have any images of like that from Helsinki. So this is, I don't know, I haven't done any extensive research, but might, might be sort of one of the first views into, into the, the Helsinki that was just built as a capital for Finland. Uh, 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 and sort of a uh, very commercial place, as you can see, with lots of boats going, uh, 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 and a sort of new symbol, in a way, for Finland. Uh, another interesting thing to look at, if we look at the, the pictures, is the sort of the uh, difference between a built-up cultural landscape and a, national, uh, a natural sort of wild landscape. And also in this aspect, I think the Avasaksa game is interesting. If we look here, this is again from Finland, from Stelti Techninger. It's a view uh, from Paloniemi in Lohja at that sort of landscape, but it's very much a, a built landscape. So you can see some houses, you can see some fences, uh, some boats, etc. And sort of, and if we look at, look at national romanticism again, there we, uh, we start to see these, these landscape landscapes without people, uh, paintings which are just depicting wild nature, which becomes a sort of national romant romanticist trope in a way. And I think the Avasaksa game is quite interesting because it's, it's kind of in the middle. Most of the images are clearly sort of cultural landscapes, but it's also touching on, on this sort of natural landscape. In, in Square 30, 34 it's dealing with, with, with the wilderness bit untouched nature. So it it's, might be sort of maybe even the first image dealing with this kind, kind of trope. Um, if we look at the game, the, the, sort of, the way it's, it's played is quite, quite uh, uh, funny because you're sort of jumping around on the board and it's, it's not a sort of very logical way of approaching from a modern perspective. So you, you start out, out from, from uh, Suomenlinna, Sveabori, and, and sort of go through all of Finland and then come back to the last image, which, which is of, of central Helsinki. And I think this is, this is sort of, if we look at the game, it's, it's quite symbolical this as well, because it's sort of moving from, from a historical past with a grave of a, uh, of a Swedish, Swedish uh, admiral, Erensvärd, who, who built, or was in charge of the building of... of, of Suomenlinna, it moves from, from a grave to a, a sort of very, very uh, uh, commercial affluent new version of what, what Finland and Helsinki is, is about. So I think sort of symbolically this could be tied to, to sort of the shift from, from a Swedish uh, influence to, to a Russian influence, especially looking at it. It, it, there's a grave depicted, sort of old Swedish history is, is sort of past, dead. Uh, like most texts and pictures from the time, it, it also deals, deals with the, the, the Finnish war, as it's called, the, the war between Sweden and, and Russia in 1808 and 1809, which Russia uh, lost, and, and uh, which was a the reason that, that Finland then became a part of. Uh, uh, Sweden lost and, and, and Finland became a part of Russia. But it's, it's maybe looking at it at a, at a, a bit different perspective than the, than the other texts we know about uh, uh, dealing with this. There's a, a sort of, there are some, some fighting places uh, which the game call, calls tappelu kenttä or, or there's tappelu going on, like a fight, like a, almost a brawl, like a fi, uh, fist fight. So, for, for example, nyt seisomme Revolahden tappelukentällä. Tässä oteltiin verisesti huhtikuun 27. päivänä 1208. So, in the upper image. But there's also a sort of, as I said, there's, there's a clear understanding that this is the past. This is, this is sort of almost a sad event. In number 41, we meet a veteran from the war. Kah tässä yksi 1208 vuoden urhoollisia soturia. 
hän kadotti toisen jalkansa virran sillan tappelussa. Uh, so so here, here's a veteran from, from the war who, who lost one of his legs in, in the fight at Wirt. And sort of especially if we compare this, this, this with, with the nationalistic texts with, that we know so well in Finland, that, that were part of building this idea of what, what Finland is, like, like the Topelius texts, or especially Runeberg's The Tales of Ensign Stahl, where the nationalism is, is sort of very different. Uh, and there's, there's sort of the view on the war is, is very different. Mm. Especially since the Avasaks game came out in fin Finnish before this was actually translated. So in a way, this uh, Runeberg's work was very much written to, to, to the Swedish-speaking uh, parts of Finland and translated later, whereas Avasaksa, interestingly, is bilingual from the start. Also an interesting example. Uh, and sort of Runeberg is, is very much, much doing a sort of romanticized version of, of what the Finnish-speaking peoples are and sort of presenting that to the Swedish-speaking, uh, maybe upper class of Finland. Mm, the national Mrs. Avasaksa is, is, is different. Uh, if we look at some other, other things still about the game, I think another interesting feature it has is that it's actually dealing also with, with minorities, ethnical minorities in Finland, which are very much exoticized. Uh, there's the Sami people, there's the Romani people. In, in square number 26, we, we meet Lappalaiset, as the, as the game says. Tässä näet pienen Lappalaisen poroinensa. Näinhän talvella ajaa ahkiossaan laulellen. So basically the Sami is just, in the winter time, he's going around in his sled and singing. Uh, a sort of very, as I said, exoticized view on what the Sami are actually doing. Uh, and another interesting thing is, is when we look at the Romani people, Mustalaiset, as it said, says in the game, Poloiset Mustalaiset, missä on isänmaanne? Muukalaisia olette joka paikassa, eikä kukaan sano teille tervetultua. So, poor Romani people, where is your fatherland? You are strangers in every place, and nobody says, bids you welcome. Uh, which is sort of interesting in a game dealing es uh, explicitly with what Finnishness is. It immediately finds these sort of minorities that are outsiders in this, in this context. Uh, so, like two squares of the 52 spa or spaces, game spaces, are dealing with, 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 uh, with, with the Swedish and Finnish-speaking places and people. It doesn't different, be, differentiate between these two languages, but two spaces are reserved for the minorities. Uh, and, and, and sort of, because the, the Romani people, they don't have their own fatherland, they don't have their own game either, it seems to be the message that the game has. So in this nationalistic context, sort of building the view of, of, of what Finland is about, they, they are uh, sort of two, two ethnicities are defined as, as, as kind of like the other. And our view of, of what the Sami are is, of course, still in many cases a similar view. As you can see, the Mar Marku Lux's, uh painting Coffee Break sort of plays around with this, with these images of what, what the Sami are in a way. Or sort of, yeah. But another another way to look at this game is is to sort of understand it kind of as a media, and it's very much a media that that's very interested in new things. The game was published in 1862. In the game, there's we can see there's the railway from Helsinki to Hämeenlinna, which was built the same year. Uh, it's dealing with coffee, which was a very new sort of, or coffee culture, coffee drinking culture, very new thing in Finland at the time, because uh, coffee drink, drinking was, was uh, illegal in Swedish times, whereas in the Russian times it gradually became uh, more common, like in the rest of Europe. It's, it's dealing with, with these different buildings. Helsinki Cathedral, we already saw, it, it was built 10 years earlier, or, or, the, or the factories in Tampere, which were b built quite recently, or different sort of uh, uh, 
different buildings and uh, 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 sort of in infrastructure projects that were used in, used, uh, built in, in Finland. Or the use of Finnish markas, which are, are dealt with in, in the rules. It's, it's based on, on using markas, which, which came in use in 1860. And also there's the tourist aspect that we return to. And for me, this is, this is sort of interesting that games were a kind of like a news media at the time. They were dealing with contemporary events. And there's lots of different examples of this as well. Uh, here's just two examples that can also be found on the, in the Doria database. Uh, a game called Nordenschel's Nordust Passage here, which is dealing with, with, with the uh, explorer Nordenschel's trip around the world, and it was published while he was still on the trip. And we can see images from all over, 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 all over Asia in this, this game, and clearly somebody was keeping contact with these, or this expedition, and then the way it was dealt, dealt with in Finland was to publish a game about it. Or, or this is a, a, the one on the left is a, is a different example, uh, the Tapra Port Arthur, Urholen Port Arthur, the only one of the games that we're looking at today, which was also published in Russian. And it's about the, the war between uh, Russia and Japan, 1904 and 1995, right? And this game was published when the, game, uh, uh, the war started. And as you can see, it's, it's very much sort of nationalistic also and, and, uh, and on the side of the Russians that, okay, now we're going to war and, and, and the Port Arthur defenders are very valiant. But also two other games of the same war were published while the war was still going on. And those sort of gradually became more, well, anti-war and maybe anti-Russian also, and it was sort of, as you know, it, it was part of, of also the sort of growing nationalism in, in Finland, and the war was a, was a sort of rallying point for, for, for Finns. So these teams in these games are very much adult teams. They, 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 they're not just sort of children's games. Uh, although Ava Saksa is a, a children's game, but still that also because it said so in the, on the cover, it's, it's uh, Nyt Barnspel, Uusi Lasten Peli, I think it's. Uh, but the teams are, are sort of on, in the other games, and also in Avasaksa, they're surprisingly sort of uh, adult uh, at the same time. And this comes, comes to, to sort of back to, to, to the fact that, for me, uh, I would see this as, as something that, that actually complements another news media from the time, newspapers, which we know quite a lot of, of their history about, uh, which were often read in the context of, of people coming together into one place, into one house, reading aloud from the newspapers to the, all the others. And these were probably played in a similar context, reading aloud, looking at the pictures together, getting news about the world. And uh, so, so and, uh, and the sort of and it's, it's also a question about technology, because newspapers were made in a very different way than these, these board games. The board games were made, made in lithographic presses, kivipaino, in Finland, which with those it was possible to make sort of large uh, colored prints, whereas the, the presses used for, for making newspapers could only do, do black and white, uh, and there weren't any, any, any pictures in, in newspapers until like 1920s or something. Or they, there might be sort of some, but it was very difficult technological proce process to get them into the newspapers. So the pictures were very few. So this sort of, my, my understanding is that, that the board games actually complemented the newspapers. So we could understand uh, these board games as, an, as a new uh, news media, but also as a new media in the understanding that we're talking about new media nowadays, uh, like internet, social media, different things like this. Because there's so many, many similarities in a way. Board games were once new, and, and they were sort of understood as new. And they were audiovisual experiences. They, they, they have beautiful images, and there's also there's the audio part because people were probably reading aloud from the, the rules. So, I think a better or a better way to understand these games would be to to sort of 
compare them to, to sort of armchair traveling, like virtual reality uh, things we have nowadays, a applications and stuff, where you can go to, to a national park somewhere and, and sort of look around, or, or understand them as sort of walking simulators in the, in the way that there's walking simulator digital games, video games nowadays, where, where people go around and sort of experience a story, because they're similar to that. And there's, there's, a, there's a media uh, or a field of media, media archaeology that sort of looks at old media as though they were new. Uh, and sort of, I think there would be lots to, to sort of find from that tradition as well. Mm. Um, and, and one of the examples that w w related to that would be, would be the sort of tourism in the game. Because the goal of the game is to go to, to, to southern Lapland, to Avasaksa, Fell Mountain, and, and look at the the white night or, 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 or of, of the summer uh, uh, and sort of do this armchair traveling. And, and another interesting thing is that, that Avasaksa was very much in, in, in vogue at the time. People from all over the world were going there. It was quite easy to reach, uh, to, to go on this experience. And, and if we look at, look at newspaper clippings from the time, people from all over were going there even from South Africa in 1865, it was part of this, this sort of nationalism in Finland, the understanding, the, the exoticizing of, of Lapland, but also a, a, a sort of armchair traveling new media where we, by which we could reach, reach the same. So, I'm starting to wrap, wrap up. Here, here's a, a table, I hope you can, you can see it. Uh, we also made a sort of comparison, statistical analysis of, of the two games, the Polish game and the, and the Avasax game, uh, of the sort of different aspects of, of them. Mm. I'll just show some highlights. I don't know if how well you probably can't see those, but uh, I think the interesting differences here are, are here with sort of the Polish game just dealing with historical events, which is for Poland, which, with, with a very shifting geography, the, the country being, being uh, uh, occupied by different forces, the Poles have sort of look, uh, gone to history to sort of understand what Polish nationalism is about. Whereas the Finnish game, it deals a bit with, with the Finnish war, but not as much, much as, as it could have if we look at the sort of earlier accounts, Topelius or, or even Runeberry. Uh, but it does deal a lot with, with sort of issues related to transportation, industry and commerce, whereas the, the, the Polish game doesn't. And the Polish game is very much connected to the Catholic Church of, of, of Poland. And the, the, the Avasaksa game doesn't really deal with religion that much. There's some depictions of churches. So, wrapping up, mm, to our knowledge, this is the first commercially released Finnish game. Um, which sort of very interestingly defines Sweden as something, uh, Finland as something between Sweden and Russia. Uh, and it's, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's more, more neutral. It, it has a more neutral understanding of, of, of nationalism than, than other sources of the time. It's a very interesting source for this, this reason. Uh, it's, it's dealing with cultural landscapes, built landscapes, but also sort of hints at the possibility that natural landscapes, the beauty of, of, of the wild, could be interesting for, for the understanding of what fin Finland is. Um, but at the same time that it's sort of defining what Finland is, what Finnishness is, it's also exoticizing the minorities in Finland. So the Sami people and the Romani people are sort of poor for Romani people, you don't have a country of your own. They aren't included in, in, in this national project of what Finland becomes. And also the, the sort of very interesting idea of war games as a news media, but also as a sort of state-of-the-art technology of the time, new media of the time, that could be expanded. But I think I'll conclude my talk here. Um, I'm open for questions in, in English, but also Finnish and Swedish if, if you are more comfortable using those languages. Eli, kiitoksia. Vastailen mielelläni kysymyksiin. Kiitos. Myös 
muuten kuin englanniksi, eli, eli suomeksi tai ruotsiksi tai siellä ainakin. Tää. Näistä vähemmistöistä. Siinä sanoit, että eksoottisia vähemmistöjä, niin tota, kun nykypäivänä on aika paljon Mä kuulen kyllä jo. Vähemmistöjä. Niin onko tuommoista vähemmistön, niin kuin, onko ne ollut koko ajan eksoottisia, jos katsotaan niin kuin suomalaisuutta ja saamelaisia, että ne aina ollut jotain, että ne vie meiltä jotain, ja ne vaan niin kuin joku outlier siellä, vai onko ollut näkyvissä sillä tavalla, että suomalaisia vähemmistöjä oikeasti on peleissä sillä tavalla niin kuin merkittävässä osassa. Ymmärrät, mitä mä tarkoitan? Joo, minusta tosi hy- hyvä kysymys. Mm, jotenkin katsoo tätä avasaksa peliä Mä vastaan nyt suomeksi, joka toivottavasti on ok. avasaksa peliä niin, niin jotenkin tuntuu, että se, sehän on nimenomaan niin kuin osa tätä Suomen valtion rakennus ja sitä niin kuin suomalaista nationalismikeskustelua siinä, siinä mielessä. Ja just saamelaiset ei ehkä niin kuin ihan mahu siihen. Ja ne, siinä määrin, mitä ne mahtuu, se on vähän niin eksotisoituna ja jonain muuna joka vaan ajelee siellä, siellä tuota reellään. Mutta sitten on tietysti saamelaisilla on oma peliperinteensä, ja, ja tuota, sitä me tiedetään, että esimerkiksi semmoinen peli kuin Pasture on, on kolttasaamelaisten perinnepeli, missä heitetään noita poronluita, ja sitten riippuen sitten, että mihin asentoon ne laskeutuu, niin, niin siinä saa eri tavalla pisteitä, että onko ne sitten niinku poroja vai, vai paimenia. Ja tuota, se, siis tämä tää on esillä tuo Suomen pelimuseossa ja sitä, sitä on myöskin tehty sellainen videodokkari yhdessä tuon saamelaismuseon Siidan kanssa. En mä nyt muista, että onko se meidän YouTube-kanavalla, mutta saattaa olla. Ja siitä saa sitten vähän tarkemman kuvan, että mikä se peli on. Mutta et, siinä, että et, et, et onko niinku, tavallaan vähemmistöt sit aina jotenkin lautapeleissä, onko ne aina suljettu, ollaanko aina suljettu ulkopuolelle, niin en mä tiedä, pystytäänkö me tämän Aavasaksa pelin perusteella sinänsä siitä ehkä niin sen tarkemmin mitä, mitään sanomaan, mutta ainakin siinä se niin hel, hel, herkästi sen voi lukea sillä tavalla. Toki nehän on mukana, että voihan se niinkin ajatella, että et, et kyllähän siinä niin suomalaisiakin paikkoja monia käsitellään vähän oudossa valossa ja, ja, ja sun muuta, mutta kyllä se niin mun silmääni niin se, se niin saamelaiskohta nimenomaan on, on niin selkeämmin, katsotaan jotain muuta. Ja se tavallaan se, miten se toiminta siinä selitetään, niin ei sitä oikein voi ymmärtää muuten kuin tämmöisenä aika eksotisoituna. Ja sitten toisaalta se, tota, sit noi, to, se, mitä siinä pelissä kutsutaan mustalaiset, poloiset mustalaiset, joilla ei ole sitä omaa kotimaata, niin sehän on niinku aika selkeästi, että, että he on nyt sitten niinku ulkopuolella tästä. Hyvä kysymys, toivottavasti mä nyt jotenkin vastasin siihen. More questions? Onko muita kysymyksiä? Siellä on toinen. Toimi. Joo. Eli tälle Aavasaksalle oli suunnittelijatiedossa, mutta miten nämä vanhat pelit, missä määrin niiden suunnittelijoista tiedetään? Uusissa peleissä se on aika isollakin yleensä laatikon kannessa, mutta miten näiden vanhojen pelien kanssa? Ö- Voisi sanoa, että tosi vähän, että yllättäen tämä ensimmäinen peli, jonka Hilda Uusson on tehnyt, se on oikeastaan niin kuin ainoita näistä, missä me tiedetään suunnitteli. En tiedä, mistä se johtuu, miksi tässä on käynyt niin. Meillähän ei ole ihan täyttä varmuutta siitä, että hän olisi ikään kuin tehnyt myös sen pelin säännöt. Siinä lukee siis, että hän on tehnyt sen litografian, eli sen, ne kuvat. Ja tota, sitten toisaalta hänen biografioissa, jotka ei sinänsä ei ole kiinnostuneita peleistä, niin niissä sanotaan myös, että hän teki myös muita pelejä. Niin tavallaan siitä mun mielestä voi vähän niin päätellä, että kyllähän niin kuin, hän oli näiden pelien tekijä myös siinä mielessä, että hän suunnitteli ne säännöt ja kirjoitti ne lorut sun muuta. Mutta ihan täysin sataprosenttista varmuutta siitä ei ole. Äh, eli siis muista peleistä ei, ei oikein tiedetä ja oikeastaan vasta äh, nyt... Saattaa olla, että, että sanon väärin, mutta mun muistikuva on niin seuraava pelisuunnittelija Suomesta, joka tiedetään, on, on tämmöinen X-pelin suunnitellut 
henkilö, joka, joka siis toisessa maailmansodassa tehtiin, tai toisen maailmansodan aikana tehtiin Suomessa tosi paljon jo pelejä. Yksi näistä suunnittelijoista oli tehnyt peli, jonka nimi on X-peli. Mä en nyt muista, mikä, mikä hänen nimensä oli, mutta hän oli siis soti, sotilasarvoltaan, oliko luutnantti vai kapteeni tai joku tämmöinen. Ehkä just se sieltä löytää lisää tietoja X-pelistä. Mutta muistaakseni se on niinku seuraava suunnittelija, joka tiedetään. Ja sit, sit siitä, kun mennään vielä 50-luvulla, niin Kari Mannerla on ikään kuin semmoinen ensimmäinen su- pelisuunnittelija tähti ikään kuin, ja hän uudistaa näitä, näitä niin kuin aikaisempia peli, pelikonventioita sitten myös. Ehkä sitäkin kautta on, on noussut niin tunnetuksi. Mutta joo, eli hyvin vähän. Ja just, että ehkä, ehkä niin kuin kuvittajia voidaan niin kuin jossain kohdin niin kuin, ää, saada selville, että he, he on usein kuitenkin allekirjoittanut ainakin jollain puumerkillä, niin, ni, niitä voidaan jotain sieltä löytää. Ja sieltä tietysti on niitä kuvittajia, jotka muutenkin on tehnyt ikään kuin käyttötaidetta siinä, siinä aikana, mutta niistä pelisuunnittelijoista meillä ei ole tietoa. Oliko meillä vielä aikaa lisäkyssäreille vai miten? Kyllä mä ajattelin yhden kysymyksen sulle heittää tässä. Tota, sä puhuit pelisuunnittelijoista, mutta toinen tietysti se suunta on se, että kenelle näitä pelejä tehtiin. Kuinka paljon me ollaan sitä selvitetty? Ketä oli pelien kohdeyleisö, kenelle ne myyti? No siinäkin kohtaa tämä, tämä tuota, Aavasaksa on aika poikkeuksellinen. Siinä lukee sääntöjen kannessa, että nyt Barnspel, uusi, onko se lasten peli, mikä siinä on sitten se käännös. Eli sitä nyt ehkä voisi päätellä, että kyllä sitä niin kuin lapsiyleisöä puhuteltiin. Mutta sitten kun katsotaan näitä muita esimerkkejä, niin kyllähän niissä on aika niin kuin selkeää, että, että eihän ne nyt ihan niin kuin, ainakaan niin kuin nykynäkökulmasta mitään lasten teemoja käsittele. Että olisiko se sitten, että niitä, niitä myöskin pelas muut, ja ehkä niin kuin vielä 1800-luvulla ei ihan niin selkeää, tai 1900-luvun alussakaan ollut niin selkeää, että mikä nyt on la, 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 lapsiyleisö, mikä on aikuisyleisö. Ne oli paljon sekottuneempia. Ja katsotaan sitä, sitä niin kuin, mitä siis noista sanomalehtien lukemisesta nyt tiedetään niin kuin vähän enemmän. Niin ihan näissä kuvissakin jo niin nähdään tuollainen aika niin kuin moni, moniulotteinen porukka. No siellä nyt ei... Vissiin lapsia. On tuossa joku, joku siinä is, istuu maassa tuossa vasemmanpuoleisessa kuvassa. Ja tuolla istuu taempana joku toinen. Niin tota, ehkä se on ollut niinku, ehkä tämän tyyppisempi se yleisö. Tästä ei ole tietoa, mutta mulla on niinku, vähän semmoinen niinku kutina, että olisiko tämä se konteksti, missä nämä pitäisi ymmärtää. Toki peleistä vielä sen verran, että et kyllähän ne on niinku selkeämmin vielä ehkä niinku ylemmille yhteiskuntaluokille tota, suunnattu. Uh, kun katsoo niitä, niitä, niitä jo, joitain niin mainoksia on säilynyt lehdistä sun muuta, niin kyllä niissä niin vähän enemmän puhutellaan niin sitä puolta kuin ehkä sit jotain ihan 1800-luvun työläisperhettä, missä ei välttämättä vielä silloin osattu 1800-luvulla lukeekaan ihan niin hyvin. Mutta tota, varmaan siis tämä on monipolvinen kysymys. Mä luulen, että se, se konteksti on ollut niin enemmän tällainen. Ehkä joissain kohdin on voinut olla, että lapset on pelannut ihan, ihan keskenään. Ja, ja tota, se on varmaan muuttunut myös siinä niin kuin vuosikymmenten mittaan. Ja, ja niin kuin viimeistään 1950-luvulla niin tullaan siihen tilanteeseen, että, että niin kuin selkeästi on olemassa niin kuin lapsipelimarkkina, joka ehkä sitten erottautuu vähän tästä aikaisemmasta todellisuudesta. Lisää kysymyksiä, more questions, Frogor. Vai onko, mikä meidän aikataulu sanoo, ollaanko me menossa eteenpäin? Voidaan ottaa vielä, jos on jotain kysymyksiä. Ilmeisesti kysymyksiin ne on vastattu. Tota, kiitos vielä, oli tosi hauska käydä juttelemaan tästä. Thank, thanks once more. Joo. Ja hei, kiitos sulle. Tota, me jatketaan lava-ohjelmalla tuossa seitsemältä ja nyt taas palatkaa ihmiset pelien pariin.